In this lecture, we are going to study the common types of bugs that can occur when you write multi-threaded programs and how you can avoid them. So in general, writing multi-threaded programs is tricky, right? Because all sorts of race conditions can happen and these bugs are non-deterministic and they occur based on the order of execution of the thread. So sometimes the bug may occur, sometimes it may not occur. It's very hard to reproduce, therefore very hard to debug, right? So we'll just see the common types of bugs that occur in this lecture and some precautions on how you can avoid them. So there are roughly two types of bugs in concurrent programs. So one kind of bugs are more dangerous. They are what are deadlock bugs. That is multiple threads get themselves into a state where they cannot execute anymore and your program just freezes. Those are called deadlock bugs. There are other type of bugs called non-deadlock bugs where your program doesn't freeze, the threads keep executing, but sometimes they crash, sometimes the results are not what you expect and so on. For example, the simple code that we saw about incrementing a shared counter without locks, right? The value of the counter was not what you expected. That is an example of a non-deadlock bug where bad things happen, but your program is still executing. So first, let's study the non-deadlock bugs, right? These are again of two types. They are what are called atomicity bugs. So these are bugs that happen because the programmer assumes certain parts of the code are going to be executed atomically, but they get interrupted in between and the atomicity assumptions are violated, right? For such things, the fixes use locks. Ensure that there's mutual exclusion and if you have a piece of critical section that you want to be executed atomically, then go ahead, use a lock and release a lock at the end of it so that it is executed atomically. Then the other type of bugs are what are called order violation bugs. That is, the programmer implicitly assumes one thread runs, does something, then the other thread runs. But sometimes the operating system might schedule this first and then it can run this thread. In such cases, you're going to be in trouble, right? So in such cases, anytime you want some ordering to be done, it is good to use condition variables to ensure that the ordering is preserved. Okay, so let's see an example of atomicity bug, right? So here is thread one. It checks if some data structure is not null, then go ahead and print it. And thread two sets this to null. Okay, so now suppose thread one runs and it has checked it is not null. At this point, it is interrupted and at this point, thread 2 runs, right? And it has set it to null. So now thread 1 comes to print it and it segmentation falls. Why? Because it is trying to print a null value. But the thread 1 code by itself is correct, right? It did check that it is not null before printing it. But it made an assumption that all of this piece of code is atomic. It assumed that nobody is going to interrupt me here. But it has been interrupted. Therefore, for such things, what do you do? A simple fix is use a lock. Hold a lock and release a lock after you're done. So that now thread 2 also needs a lock and it cannot run in between, right? So thread 2 will not be able to run in between here. Why? Because it does not need, does not hold a lock. So locking guarantees you atomicity. So another bug is an order violation bug. So thread 1 initializes something and thread 2 assumes that the variable is initialized. But it could happen that thread 2 runs first because of the operating system scheduler. In such cases, what do you need? Use a variable and thread 2 checks this variable. And if the initialization is not done, it will wait. And once thread 1 does the initialization, it will signal this condition variable so that thread 2 can run next, right? So use condition variables or semaphores in order to ensure certain ordering of threads. This happens only then the next thread runs. So using locks and condition variables correctly is going to fix most of your non-deadlock bugs. So now we come to some deadlock bugs, right? So here is a very simple example, a classic example of a deadlock. You have thread 1, it acquires lock 1, lock 2 and then does something. Thread 2 acquires lock 2, then lock 1, then does something. Okay. 
So in a normal scenario, if life is good, then what will happen? Thread one runs, it acquires both its lock, it finishes its, its work, releases both the locks. Then thread two runs and it acquires both the locks. Everything is fine. But what is the problem? A problem occurs when thread one has acquired lock one and at this point it gets interrupted and then thread two runs. Okay, so thread one has acquired lock one. Now thread two has acquired lock two and it is waiting for lock one. Thread one has acquired lock one and it is waiting for lock two. Now thread one has L1, thread two has L2 and both of them are waiting for the next lock and they are not going to release the previous lock and both of them cannot proceed, right? So this is a deadlock. What is happening here? If you look at this dependency graph, it's easy to see here, right? Thread 1 holds lock L1, thread 2 holds lock L2, but thread 1 is waiting for L2, thread 2 is waiting for L1. So you have a cycle in this dependency graph and this is a classic example of a deadlock. Each thread cannot proceed because it doesn't get the other lock and because it doesn't release the first lock, the next thread cannot proceed. So you need certain conditions to hold for a deadlock to occur, right? We need to understand these so that we know what, how to avoid this deadlock. So the first condition is mutual exclusion. A thread holds a resource exclusively, a lock. And it holds a resource and it is waiting for another resource. There is a hold and wait. And there is no preemption, right? Once you've given a thread a lock, there's no easy way to take it back. And you have a circular weight. That is, you have the cycle that we've seen on the dependency graph, right? Like this. So if all of these four conditions hold, then you have a deadlock. And people have theoretically proved that you need all four of them to hold for a deadlock. Even if one of them is not true, then the deadlock won't occur. So how do you prevent deadlocks, right? We should try and make some of these conditions false. We should make sure that not everything is going wrong at the same time. So how can you prevent circular weight? This is an easy fix, right? This is one of the standard principles that programmers are taught when writing code with locks, which is if you're acquiring multiple locks, always acquire the locks in the same order. That is those two threads which were acquiring L1, L2, if they had always acquired L1 before L2, then your deadlock would not happen because there is no possibility of a circular weight, okay? Because the first thread would have acquired L1, then you would have switched to the second thread, which would have simply waited for L1. It wouldn't have gone to L2, okay? And for this to happen, you need some sort of an ordering on the locks, right? Either a total order on all locks or even a partial order on a set of related locks must be followed. For example, you can order the locks by the address of the lock variable, right? This is one way or you can use any other way to address the locks, to order the locks. For example, here are two locks M1 and M2. You check their addresses. If the address of one is greater than the other, if M1 is greater than M2, you acquire M1 and M2. Otherwise, you acquire M2, M1. Whatever, whichever way you choose to order the locks, if you order them, then you're going to acquire locks in the same order and you're not going to have the circular weight situation. So another technique is to avoid hold and wait. Instead of holding one lock, another lock, another lock, what you can do is have one big fat lock first. Everybody just acquires this lock before they do their other lock acquisitions. So that there is no situation where you're holding a few locks and waiting for a few more locks, right? Everything just depends on this one lock. But this, of course, might prevent concurrent executions, right? Because if this is like coarse grain locking. and But if you think there's a possibility of deadlock, you should use some such thing. And there have also been other solutions proposed to deadlock where the operating system comes into the picture, right? For example, people have uh, developed algorithms. The banker's algorithm is a popular one. And all of these algorithms assume that if the operating system knows which process needs which locks, then it can somehow work out a schedule where deadlock will not occur, right? So, for example, consider a simple example where you have two locks and you have four threads, T1, T2, T3, T4. And T1 needs lock L1, L2, T2 needs lock L1, L2, T3 needs only L2, T4 doesn't need any of these locks. If you knew this information beforehand that these threads are going to acquire these locks, 
then the operating system can come up with a possible schedule that will not result in a deadlock right there are algorithms that let you do that for example it can execute t3 and t4 on one cpu and t1 and t2 on the other cpu so the key idea is do not execute t1 and t2 together why because if you execute them together then they might request the same locks l1 l2 one request l L1, L2, the other request L2, L1 and they might get into a deadlock. Therefore, do them one after the other. Finish T1, let it finish L1, L2, release the locks and then run T2. Right? So, the operating system, if it knows this information, then it can tweak its schedule accordingly. But we are not going to spend a lot of time on uh, such algorithms because these are not practical to implement in real life right because uh, today's operating systems have no idea about which locks the process wants to acquire they don't have that level of visibility into the process therefore none of these are used in real systems today so today uh, most systems don't do anything for deadlocks right so if a deadlock happens your system freezes you reboot it so an operating system could detect deadlocks at least it could detect that a circular wait is happening and it can simply reboot or kill the processes that are deadlocked that's the least thing that one could do and most operating systems just stick to the very basics when it comes to deadlocks